No, I would just say what's wrong. All right, you guys ready to rock and roll? Yes, sir. Let's do it. All right, so we're going to switch gears here a little bit in this class. Um, there's a couple things that we wanted to get out to the officers. One was some of the things that we learned from uh, Kill the Flashover. When Kill the Flashover came down to level and they asked our fire behavior committee to come down and assist them with that process. Really good experimental burns that they did down there. Um, and we learned some things that we wanted to bring to PFA and then also kind of wanted to start uh, shelling out some of the information that I learned from my trip to Sweden. Uh, wanted to go out there and learn from them as far as how they teach fire behavior and how they instruct their live fire um, on the drill grounds. Uh, really didn't take, I mean, there was definitely some good take home stuff from that trip to Sweden, but we're really close. We've done a lot so far with vent limited fires, and there's just a few things that we're missing. Um, so we're really excited to kind of start, you know, giving that information out. As you know, with our calendar and trainings and the logistics of getting information out, it's tough. So we kind of had to think outside the box with Hal and Mike presenting their flow study stuff. We thought, well, don't really want necessarily the captains in there just doing hydraulic problems over and over again. So maybe this would be a good time we can split them out and start teaching some of this stuff. So that's what we're gonna do today. So over there, everything that they talked about is based off of the, the fire flow formulas, right? And all those pictures that they showed with the, the box, you know, theory and stuff like that to determine what kind of lines and GPMs we need to flow. You probably saw something that was uh, consistent amongst all those pictures. They were fully involved, right? A lot of openings, getting lots of air, some of those you could argue that it was still vent limited inside and that's one of those concepts that are very important that everybody needs to know is that just because we have fire blowing out you know it doesn't mean that it's not vent limited we can still have uh, vent limited conditions inside but that's when we want big droplets and that's when we want big gpms and what we're going to be talking about in here is we're going to uh, teach some in-depth stuff about thermal imagers and how we can use them and then we're going to shift into gas cooling Okay. So out in Sweden, they talked a lot about um, direct and indirect attacks, right? And they asked, particularly me from America, to find that for me. What is that? And so basically I gave them, I was like, well, a direct attack is when you're actually hitting the seat of the fire, and indirect is when you're doing something that's not <coughs> hitting the seat of the fire, basically. And they're like, well, you're right. And they said, when they look at that in Sweden, they have an issue with that, because that's basically, those definitions are how you're doing it. Okay, that's how you're applying the water. And they look at it a little bit different. They say, well, we look at it and say, we're either surface cooling or we're gas cooling. And that kind of incorporates a little bit of the why. Why are you applying the water that you're doing, okay? So we're gonna really be talking about vent limited conditions and then not actually hitting the seat of the fire. We're gonna be talking about gas cooling, controlling that environment a little bit more. And with the thermal imagers, we're gonna be able to show you how you can kind of tell the environment that you have, do something about it, and then gauge your gauge the effectiveness of the actions that you've taken on that environment, okay? So we'll get on with it. When we talk about gas cooling, or I'm sorry, we're gonna start off with uh, thermal imagers here. So there's lots of things that we can do to kind of be able to figure out what kind of problem that we have, okay? So we can do our size up, our 360. One thing that we've really been talking a lot to the officers about is looking at the building itself. Not getting zoned in on just one thing, but taking in everything. And one of those big things is kind of the ventilation profile. What do I have open? And is that opening good for me or is it bad for me? If it's bad for me, can I change it? Can I shut it down? Can I close it up? <clears throat> if I can't, is it so detrimental? Is that gonna change my hose line placement? I wanted to go in here, but due to the fact that I have an uncontrolled opening here, might cause me to put my hose line in a different place, right? So understanding that ventilation, and that's something here at PFA, you know, we always put that ventilation piece towards the truck, but as tactical engine officers, we have to have a good understanding of ventilation, because like I said, it could dictate our hose line placement. Um, and with that too, we want to be able to use our ticks to you know, identify where the fire is so that we can have good hose line placement and appropriate water application. And then also we can use our ticks for enhanced search methods as well. <clears throat> so up here, you're gonna see a bunch of different numbers, numbers that we know. Um, and you're going to see that a lot of them, for the most part, are going to fall right in line with like that 500 degree mark, right? And that's going to be uh, kind of important as we talk about gas cooling. Uh, we've had some uh, upgrades with our SBA mask. Instead of failing, we're starting to fail about 350 degrees. Now they're up closer to 500, which is good. Uh, but these are just some numbers that we know. 
These are some of the things we're going to talk about with, uh, with our ticks. We're going to review kind of what the field of view is on those imagers, the modes of operations and how those work, the colorization, colorization of the palette, the resolution, the distance to spot ratio, and emesficity. And it's amazing that I got that word out because it's a hard word to say. So we're going to watch this quick little video and all this is to just kind of illustrate the difference in field of view. So you can see this outer video here is from a, probably like a GoPro or something like that and you can see that we have a very wide field of view. And with our imagers, it's a little bit limited. Okay, so we just have to understand that it's a pretty basic concept with these. But just like with any other camera, typically from right to left, we're going to have a little bit wider view than we do from top to bottom. Okay? And holding the tick in a traditional manner with the handle down and in an upright position, that's going to be good if we're looking at a big area, okay, a big room. We're trying to take in the whole picture of a house. If we are making a hallway or we're inside a small room where we want to see more from top to bottom, consider tilting the camera kind of like the, the old gangster lean, you know, how, how gangsters shoot their, their pistols with it cocked off to the side. Try that and you'll get a little bit more top to down. Um, you know, field of view if you're trying to especially look down a hallway and you want to see what the floor is doing as well as the ceiling. <coughs> so the modes and color palette. So I'm going to start this video here and I'm going to point out some things that are very important that we found that a lot of people just didn't know about their, uh, their ticks. So up here it's hard to see, okay, but in the upper right hand corner of all of our imagers, some of them are going to be down here in the bottom, but for the most part, they're either going to be here or here. You're going to see basically a letter. And up here, it's hard to see, but it says H, okay? And that's for the high range of the uh, thermal imager. So if you turn on a tick in an ambient room like this, it's going to be in the high range, okay? And you're going to see that the thermal scale on the side is going to be very low. So right now, the top reading, anything in red, is going to be 390 or above, right? Down here, we got... Uh, um, the mid sensitivity level and you can see it might be hard to see from from where you're sitting but you can see now the reds start at 500 okay so a different scaling option and so a lot of our folks that might be far-sighted always have a I have always said man I have a hard time I can't I don't know if I can read that but if you can read these these are going to be a little bit bigger and you understand how those ranges will adjust you can tell which mode you're going to be in and typically in this uh, high range, it's going to be right around the upper ends of 300. The mid range is going to be roughly around 500. And then the low range or the 1000 plus range that you're going to see here shortly is going to be typically 1000 to 2000. Okay, so just by seeing that scale, you can tell which mode you're in. And so we're going to play this video and you're going to see why this is important. So down here in the bottom corner, we have basically the fire room. And then this bigger screen is the room that's adjacent to the fire. Okay, so the fire is going to start developing, and we're going to start seeing some changes in the atmosphere in here. And so you can see this one's already switched, so it went from that high sensitivity range. Okay, now it's in the mid sensitivity range, so it's matching this one. They're both in mid. Okay, because you can see the scales are identical. Okay. And then I want you to watch this bottom one here. This one's going to shift from the mid range to the low range. Okay, so we'll just kind of keep watching that as the fire develops and it'll make a shift automatically. We don't have to do anything to do that. And then I'm going to show you how you can make, you can force the camera to switch modes as you need it based off of the needs. And we're going to describe those times where you're going to possibly need that. So keep watching that. It's going to shift. Did you see it there? There. No. Everybody see that clear? Anybody need me to rewind it? Okay. So what changed in that view? It the fire went from a bigger fire down to a smaller fire. Exactly. Exactly. So we get a little bit more clarity, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason why we have these different modes, and our cameras are really good, and there's some cameras like we had Wellington down here, they only had like two modes, and they didn't have a color palette either. Everything was grayscale. So if everything stayed in like a mid or a high range, once it got really hot, what are you going to see? A whole lot of red. Just a lot of red. Yeah. yeah. And so that's the reason for these mode changes. If you find yourself in a flashover condition or something like that, you want it to switch to a lower sensitivity to where you can still find a door or something like that. Because if you're in a super hot environment and everything's red, then you can't use that tick to help you find your way out. Okay? So we'll keep playing this here. And we'll talk about a few other concepts that we can pull from this. And so now down here it says 1220. Okay? 
So everything in red is 1220, okay? Everything in yellow is gonna be roughly like 700, and then everything in white is gonna be roughly 500. So you can see the difference here. Now everything in yellow here is 300, right? And red is only 500, okay? And you can start, as this really starts to develop, you'll see some currents. You can kind of see everything flowing that way. Do you see that? Yeah. The bottom layer of that thermal line. We can use those ticks to kind of help us determine where the fire is at, right? Because the fire is wanting oxygen, so it's going to be starting to pull stuff in. So if you look at this image versus this, this image, okay, which one looks hotter? Like if you didn't look at temperature scales or anything like that, you're just looking at the pallet, which one would, would you say looks hotter? The top on, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's starting to get a lot of red in it. But like we said, up here, the red is only 500, where, the, where down here, 500 is actually white, okay? So we'll keep playing this, and you'll see this one kick over to the low sensitivity, and you'll see how that palette's gonna change again. And again, as we know, the crosshair is, this temperature is only reading what's in the crosshair there. So now this one's getting pretty hot, right? Because mm -hmm. we know it's in low sensitivity, and everything's starting to red out. Now this one's gonna switch up here real quick, or hopefully here pretty soon. And you'll see the change in the palette. Gotta have faith, Lenny. <laughs> Gotta have faith. <laughs> so you see a shift? Yeah. Now look at how, how much more definition you can see and what's happening in the environment. You can see the off-gassing, things like that, right? And now, if you needed to get out, you have a much better image as far as what's going on in that building in order to be able to try to get out of there, right? Does that make sense as far as how the modes work? Okay, and we'll go on, on to the drill ground uh, in the burn building, you're gonna have lots of time to spend with your imager and move that thing around and watch those mode shifts, okay? So these are just some pictures to kind of illustrate those modes. So this is a, a brand new camera that we have. It's uh, at station three. Scott Wiggins is in charge of our thermal imager. So of course, the folks that are in charge of programs get all the fancy newer equipment. So if you want to see the latest and greatest, you can go over and see Scott Wiggins. So this is in the high sensitivity range. So this was, I just took this in their office. I had a cup of coffee and I just took a picture of me scanning the cup of coffee. So high range, you can see that the top number is only 390, right? Um, some of the newer images, this little thing right here, it'll have like a, um, it tells you that it's on a heat sensing mode. So that crosshair will move. It won't necessarily always be in the center. It'll seek out the hottest thing in the room. And then you can switch that over to a cold sensing thing. So like if you're trying to pick up like a gas leak or something like that, you can switch it over to the cold and that crosshair will seek out the coldest thing in the room. Wow, that's cool. Okay, but that's only on the latest and greatest. Most of our takes don't have that. Um, this is for the mid sensitivity range and you can see it being indicated down here. And so you can notice that the crosshair is on the firefighters, not the fire room itself. And so you can see, you can really see a lot of detail in their equipment, all the ridges on their helmets and everything. And then look in the fire room, you can't really see too much, right? Because, because of the mode that it's in, it's reading out at, at things that are super hot. So that's how we can move things over. Even though we're right next to a hot environment, if I move it over to a colder one, I can force it back into that mid-range, okay? And the next picture is gonna show the crosshairs being moved into the fire room, kicking over to what's called the EI, or the low sensitivity, the thousand plus mode, and you can see how it changes. Mm -hmm. Don't have the clarity on the firefighters now, but now I get a little bit more clarity in that room. Does that make sense? So, and that's just simply for moving the crosshair from a colder environment to a higher one. All right, so this is just talking about the resolutions of the cameras. And pretty much off the shelf tips and most of the brands, this is where theirs are at. Um, Scott gets us once with a little bit of an upgrade and then you can get one with the, the highest resolution you can get is right here. And so that basically just tells you how far away you can see things. So this is a, uh, a tick image of some firefighters doing a search coming in and getting a victim, but what's wrong with this picture? They're the, in the hot, and, and so the, the victims are hotter than what the room is, and exactly. so it's going to be just the opposite. Of what we'd see in a real fire, right? Correct. If this is what we see when we train, <laughs> but it's not going to be what we're going to see in real life, mm -hmm. right? So in real life, it's going to look like those firefighters in that mid-range picture mm -hmm. that I showed you, where they're going to be more darker grade scaled, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. And so we're trying to 
come up with some creative ways on how we can train better with our ticks. So we're not so used to seeing this and then when we go into a fire, we're looking for the white, <laughs> right? Where we should be looking for a grayscale type stuff for, for victims. So distance to spot ratio, basically the worst case scenario, it's gonna be 12 inches around that, okay? So 12 inches, respectively based on the building or the object that you're putting on is the biggest sample it's going to take so if you're really wanting to get real precise like doing overhaul work uh, and you're wanting to you know get a smaller spot than 12 inches then get up closer to it okay uh, so it's kind of like a flashlight right if, you're, if I'm trying to shine it up against that far wall it's going to be a bigger spot if I get up closer and put my hand over it, it's going to be smaller okay? uh, that fancy word emesficity freak out every time I have to say that but basically it just it, it, it's a word on how much feedback we're getting from objects okay and the way they the scale that they um, grade this on is zero to hundred or to one so it's a pretty small scale all of our imagers are pretty are, and pretty much all the imagers on the market are set up to read 0.95 as far as a basic setting and we all know that if we shoot our tick into a piece of glass or a mirror or something like that, we don't get a good reading. Yeah. Mirrors, we also get reflections and things like that. Stainless steel objects if we're in a commercial kitchen and things like that. But all of our owner's manuals, they kind of have like a, like a list of materials and basically they show the emesficity value of it. And then based off of that, they give you, okay, if you're looking at a stainless steel uh, refrigerator, um, it's going to be 40% accuracy with the temperature reading we're getting off of it. Okay? If you're reading a cast iron skillet, it's going to be within 10%. So if it's saying it's 1,000 degrees, then it's going to be you know, at the lowest, maybe 900, and at the highest, maybe 1,100. So pretty close. Okay? And we're finding that our ticks are very, very accurate. So the application of how we use this, understand the mode changes, how we can move that cursor to basically force it into a mode to get clarity for what we want to see. But oftentimes we get focused on just this and reading this number, okay? But use this scale off to the side, it'll tell you a lot, right? And so right now, we just know that this is over 500. But if we really want to see what was going on, if we just move the cursor over here, we'd probably force it into a mode shift and we could get a better indication of total all temp you know, the range of temperatures that we have coming through that window and more specifically what we have at the door when we're going in. So one of the things that we learned at uh, Kill the Flashover and the Swedes and a lot of Europeans use this too is they do a door procedure, okay? And they call it the go no go procedure. You don't necessarily have to do this all the time. It's going to be on fires that are well advanced where you're kind of like you're almost second guessing as officers like should we make entry? Is this the right thing to do? And so they just added a little bit more um, giving us tools on what we can read to better make that decision. And then with gas cooling, we can do some things to see if we can take control of that situation. And a lot of people look at this when we first started talking about go no go decision making, they're like, oh, you're putting limits on, you're putting restrictions on when we can make entry. And that's not the case. <clears throat> I think we're actually providing more information to make a better educated decision on whether or not you should make entry and providing you tools. Maybe in situations you're like, man, this is not safe to enter. We're gonna give you some things that you can do Gauge it, yeah, we're making improvements. Now we can make a more safer entry. And that's all we're trying to do here. So <clears throat> we haven't come up with any value. Uh, Kill the flashover was saying that you absolutely need to do gas cooling if you have anything over 500 degrees. Loved one's a little bit ahead of us. We've been working with them really close, going down and burning with them a bunch, uh, Jason Bennett and I. They have a value of 400. And they say if you have anything 400 and above, then you have to do this. Um, in Sweden, I asked that question to them. They said, man, if you have temperatures of 200 or above, do something. And their reason behind it is, is as we're going to see with gas contraction, you have enough temperature, right? Because what, uh, what temp does uh, water boil at? 212. 212, right? So they're like, if you have 200 or above, probably have enough temperature to convert, convert to steam, and that's how you control smoke. Um, so we don't, as a fire behavior committee, we haven't come up with a value. Okay, all this stuff, there's very few absolutes when it comes to fire behavior. We know if we get fire more air, it's gonna get bigger. We know if we take air away from fire, it's gonna cool down and it's gonna shut itself down. That's an absolute. With this stuff, there is no absolute. 
But what we want is you to understand the scientific principles behind this and you make the decision. You make the decision on what you do at the door, okay? Next one is just kind of like a little layout of kind of that go-no-go -go decision of things that you're looking at. Temperatures above 500, we should be very concerned about that, right? Just showed you values of where our equipment fails at, right? Our SCBA mask, our gear itself, things like that. Are people gonna be living in conditions like this? Probably not. <laughs> We're looking at the smoke. Is it pressurized? Is it dark? Is it twirling as it's coming out of the door? Things like that. Um, can we see the thermal imaging device or did it take a dump on us at the door? And if, it, and if we can't use our kick, it's going to severely alter whether or not we should be going inside. If we can't get a temperature reading or, or have a tool to be able to evaluate the things that we're going to be doing as far as gas cooling and whether or not it's effective, then we should be very, very cautious or maybe decide to do something different. If the neutral plane is 50% of the opening or greater and it's decreasing, that, that's, a, that's a huge concern for us as well. Any questions on that as far as tick use goes before we get into the gas cleaning? And like I said, we're going to get a lot of hands-on practice when we go out into the drill ground. All right, so now we're going to talk about con controlling smoke. And this is like one of the biggest takeaways from my trip that I really thought we could do here at PFA because we never ever talked about it. We're really good at surface cooling, right? Good at going in and putting water on the red stuff. But uh, we're not so good at this, and I think we just didn't quite understand it. <clears throat> and none of this is new. That's what the cool thing about this. It's a cool thing, and it's a frustrating thing about it. When I was out there in Sweden, they all had us do like uh, introductions, and Lars, the lead instructor, the first question he asked, he's like, I want to know, I want to know why you came out here. Why did you travel so far to learn from us? And one of the guys from the Netherlands was like, I wanted to come out to basically the Mecca of fire behavior, where it all started, and, and learn, you know? And he stopped him, and he said, no, 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 it didn't start here. Then he pointed at me and he said, it started in the United States. Hmm. But then he followed it up by saying, you know what, but they didn't listen. Because when do you think this came out in the United States? Anybody have any ideas? Well, oh, yeah, pretty close. It came out in the 1940s is when it really kind of took a big, when it came out. And Lloyd Lehman was the one that came out with it. And I'm sure probably, you know, the more senior folks in here, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Lloyd Lehman. Uh, Lloyd Lehman was the one that basically kind of came up with these concepts. And we got some books in our library from Lloyd. And if you ever get an opportunity to read them, uh, check them out. The first time I read a Lloyd Lehman book, I was floored at how well this guy understood fire. And really, I think what happened in the US was people were looking at Lloyd's work because he was in the military and he was in charge of the fire protection. And so he did a bunch of studies on ships. And he basically took a machinery room and he lays out the dimensions of it and everything and he was basically doing test fires in there. But they were petroleum based, okay? And so a lot of people looked at that and they said, ah, Lloyd, he's crazy. He did them on ships, he was doing them with petroleum fires and they were non-vented. And that's, and that's not true either. He had a vent opening because the machinery room had an open vent to it. He describes the actual dimensions of the of the vent opening because that was important for his calculations and then also even though he was doing petroleum fuels how do our modern fuels burn petroleum like petroleum products <laughs> <laughs> right and so he started doing a lot of work with fogs and people are like eh, fog's stupid you know he was doing them on ship containers and stuff like that and so kind of got lost but then there was a guy in sweden named mots ronders who heard about lloyd and layman studied him and he's like man i want to go out to the u.s and learn from them so he came out and he spent a month out in LA County, spent a month out in Jacksonville Fire Department, and he came to realizations like, man, they are not doing anything that Lloyd talked about. And he's like, I wonder why. And so he started looking into it. He thought Lloyd was correct. Uh, when it came to gas cooling, Lloyd determined that a 0.3 millimeter, I don't know how they figured this out, but a 0.3 millimeter water droplet is ideal for gas cooling. Took all that back out to Sweden, did his own studies and tests, confirmed the same thing. And then we also had, uh, uh, Floyd Nelson from the United States in the 70s kind of continued Lloyd's work. He confirmed it too. And uh, so Mott's went out to Sweden, confirmed everything, and basically created the Swedish model of firefighting that's kind of running through Europe right now. So that's a little bit of the history of it. So when we look at... Okay. Yeah. Why, why was it that we stopped and didn't follow his, his thought? You know, it's, it, you know, I think uh, no one really knows the answer to that. I have my own personal beliefs to it. And the more I talk to the folks in, in Europe, uh, at Kill the Flash over, we had uh, Dr. Michael Reich from Germany out here. Really interesting man. He, he developed and 
makes the smoke blockade, the smoke curtain that's in production now. Right. And uh, it's interesting, I think it's a difference in culture. Cause like out there, firefighters are no greater than the baker, person that makes the, you know, fixes the shoes, teachers or anything like that. Gotcha. But you know, as well as I do here in the United States, we're seen as something different. Right. And oftentimes I think uh, <clears throat> folks within our profession, instead of just looking at it as this is what I do, uh, we look at it as saying, that's who I am, okay? And really, and this is just my own personal belief, but who you are is your family that came before you, who raised you, instilled your values, and the family that you currently have, whether you you know be a wife, kids, whatever. That's really who you are. Being a firefighter is what you do. Don't get me wrong, I take what I do pretty serious. But if we, if we personalize who we are with what we do, then if you're asked to change, or if you're saying, I think you're doing it wrong, I think we could be doing it better, you see the difference? Oh, yeah. If you personalize with oh, yeah. it, yeah. You're asking me to change, you mean I can't go up and cut a hole in a roof? That's what I do, right? Okay, right. out in Europe it's not like that. Now granted, they do get some pushback on things, but it's much easier because they, and I, that's just my own opinion. I don't think they personalize who they are with their jobs, okay? So when we look at uh, controlling smoke, these are some of the terms that you're gonna be seeing if you do any reading on it. And I posted on Target Solutions under Fire Behavior, uh, the book from, uh, um, Floyd Nelson and I tell you that's probably one of the best documents about fire behavior it's called quantitative quantitative fire behavior um, it's a great book um, and it's super hard to find it's like the holy grail if you if you search for it if you're just gonna see block side after block side of people saying does anybody have a copy of this I want to get my hands on it and you cannot find it and it's a really good book and he breaks it fire behavior from the scientific side down very easily and uh, a lot of things that you we're gonna see here he, he talks about in the book so if you want a good read check it out uh, but if you look at this if stuff you can find I like I said we have it it's a pretty rough PDF Chief Callahan had a paper copy of it and uh, he gave it to me and I read it and I was like oh my god this guy I mean all the stuff from you well all that stuff it boom it's right there oh. and so I uh, put it into an electronic file and it's out there for everybody so anybody can read it. and like I said we're lucky to have it because it's hard to find so when we look at controlling smoke, these are some of the terms that we're going to see. We're going to be talking about gas cooling. If we're able to cool, we're going to be able to take advantage of gas contraction. And that's a misconception when we look at steam conversion, is we think about expansion. But when we cool, we get contraction. And you're going to see that today in here, and we're going to do it out on the drill ground as well. The other word you're going to hear is ballasting. And does anybody want to take a shot at what ballasting is, just from a general definition of it? And like Sean Brand had a good one. He's like, man, the only thing I think of is on ships. I was like, exactly, tell me about that. And he's like, well, they put extra weight in certain areas of the ship to balance it out. And that's exactly what it is. Ballasting is just mass, okay? So smoke is a ballast, okay? And smoke really doesn't have a lot of mass in it because it's superheated, so it's very expanded out. So, you know, per unit of measure, it's very low in mass. So when we look at ballasting smoke, we are adding mass to the smoke. And what we want to add is beneficial mass <laughs> for us, unbeneficial mass for fire, okay? And really what we're trying to do is put non-combustible ballast into the smoke and take control of it again, okay? And we can do that with water and we can do it with dry cam, okay? So let's have everybody kind of come up around this table. Like I said, we are filming this so we can send it out to the folks that missed it. So try to stay away from the front, try to be off to the side here. So what I have up here is basically just some uh, pictures of candle flames. And a simple candle is a great way to just understand the basic concept of fire. Okay? And a candle flame is basically a diffusion flame. So any gaseous flame is a diffusion flame. Okay? So up here we have a very stable diffusion flame. Over here we have an unstable diffusion flame. And what's the difference between those two? That you see? Yeah. What else do we see? One's creating something that the other isn't. Smoke. Smoke, right? So why is this one smokier than this one? Air is either moving it or it's not a good complete burn. There you go. So the air that's moving that column, the stable column, right now it's very efficient. All the gases that are produ being produced down low are going through a very complete combustion process going straight up through the top. As the currents move this one, as that process happens, that column's moving and it's getting broken out of that, basically that chemical reaction being incomplete and then it's turning into smoke, okay? Due to that incompletion, right? So 
So when we look at gas cooling, a simple candle flame is very, very useful for this. So is that a solid flame, do you think? Well, just on that outside where it's meeting the air. Why is that? Because that's where the combustion occurs. Because it needs to have that air. There you go. And inside there's nothing for it to, there's nothing for it to. It's too rich in there, right? Mm -hmm. It's too rich, it's over carbureted. It's got too much fuel, and it can't get in contact with the oxygen. And is oxygen a fuel? Do we burn it? Yes. Or no, not truly. What is it? It's an accelerant. Yeah, or sort of. It's an oxidizer, right? Yeah. And so like uh, in some of the stuff that we're going to send out, we're going to put pure oxygen on a flame. And who, who would think that would be crazy? I used to think it was crazy. Because <laughs> we're taught that oxygen is flammable. Right. Yeah. Oxygen is not flammable. Pure it's an oxygen oxidizer. is. Yeah. yeah. Well, oxygen at any percentage isn't. It's an oxidizer. So if there's flame present, it'll make flame bigger <laughs> because it's got more oxidizer to, to make that go. Right. But if I, I wish I had just an O2 bottle with a, we could, we could put it on there, it's not gonna jump back into the can. Oxygen itself is not flammable. If, if, if this was filled with 100% oxygen, we tried to light a fire in here, it wouldn't sustain, it would make whatever we're lighting more intensified, that's it, okay? So if I put the screen over top of this candle flame, you can see if you want to kind of come and poke your head over, you can see that it's hollow inside. Mm -hmm. Illustrating your point, right? Mm -hmm. That the gases inside are too rich. It's not in, in contact with the outside atmosphere in order to receive that oxidant, oxidizer in order to have combustion inside, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody understand that? So how come we don't have flame above the screen? It didn't got enough heat up above there. Yeah, so the screen's taking the heat out of it. Yeah. Right? So do you think the smoke coming up above it will light off? No. It's not rich enough then. Maybe once it, it has an ignition. So yep. So if I reignite it, see oh. how that flame reignites? So it shows us that smoke is flammable, which we yeah. all know, right? And so it basically it's just the screen's just taking the heat out of it but if we give it another heat source it will light off and another video that we'll send out through target solutions at some point probably next year is we'll basically put some wood in one of these uh, uh flasks we'll heat it up and pyrolysize it we'll collect the smoke off of it let it cool down and then we'll push the smoke through a candle flame and you'll see that it's still flammable even at wow. that's how much fuel is still in there huh. okay so, but the screen is a good illustration because if you read the European model of firefighting, especially when it comes to gas cooling, they talk about the 3D approach to firefighting. Anybody ever heard that, 3D firefighting? And it's something I didn't understand until I went on the trip. But if we look at this and what this does to that candle flame, right? It's one layer, mm -hmm. large surface area due to the meshing, right? Put it over the flame and it cools it, right? And it's basically just, all that is is flammable gas. That's, that's igniting right now. Okay, so 3D firefighting when it comes to, that's not, 3D firefighting has nothing to do with surface cooling. It only has, applies to gas cooling. So if I put a fog pattern into hot gases, this is just one layer of it. One layer of fine molecules, that 0.3 millimeter, right, that Lloyd Lehman came up with, and it cools it off. But 3D is, means that I, with a fog pattern, not only do I have one layer, but I have another layer, and another layer, and another layer. So we're using surface area to our advantage combat something that has a bunch of surface area too and that's the way gas works right so in the demonstration you know in the talk over there everything was about surface point right big water big droplets right and we need that any big structural members take a long time to catch on fire if you hold a uh, a match to a two by four it's going to take a long time right and so when we want to cool those down we need to do that same process we need to apply a lot of water over a long period of time okay so i just have some flour in here to kind of illustrate that point if i try to light the fire uh, the flour on fire maybe if i sat here for an hour or so but it's not going to light right due to low surface area yeah, surface area. okay so now i have some flour in here and i'm going to blow blow it distribute it across the candle flame and what do you think is going to happen it will be the light yeah so it'll just <laughs> so all I did was just change the surface area, right? Yeah. 
Greg's well, still kind of cold. Would you? Yeah, he went up. So. Lars has a good analogy. He always says, is it a GPM problem or is it a water distribution problem? Hmm. Okay. And so just like fire, like if we showed up at a cabinet shop and all the sawdust got disturbed, that would be fire using surface area to combat us, right? Okay. And so when we're trying to com uh, control those types of environment, gaseous, high surface area environments like smoke, we want to use large surface area to combat it too. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So. If I put my, this is my handy dandy nozzle, and I try to put it on a straight stream and combat that gaseous fire, it's not real effective, right? Then I put it on a fog pattern. Again, that straight stream is good for surface cooling. Right. No doubt, Lloyd Lehman even said that, the Swedes say it too. But if I put it on a fog nozzle, very effective because I just increase the surface area. With it. And that's all we're doing with, with gas cooling, okay? So, I'm gonna need a, can I have my vanna? Over here to assist me. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll relight this candle here. And so Lenny, if you want to just kind of hold that about EA. Yeah. And so we can also change the environment too using dry cam. This is something I never even thought of. Okay. So with dry cam, we're not gonna have cooling or contraction, okay? But we can inert it. We can inert the environment. So smoke it works just like propane, okay? It has a lower explosive li limit and it has an upper explosive limit. And so at the lower explosive limit, that's when we see like mild fire type events. And then right when it's prime, we get the rapid ones. And then up at the upper end, we get mild ones too, okay? Oh, Lenny. <laughs> I was playing with it to see how far I could go. <laughs> and so cool. what I have in here is nitrogen. Is this flammable? No. No, it's an inert gas, okay? So this is ballast. Okay, this is mass I'm gonna put in there that won't burn. Okay, and I'm gonna use it for fire suppression. Boom! Oh, <laughs> 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 okay. Put a little more. Go a little more. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> that's my captain. <laughs> it's gonna take a little while. And so basically we put enough ballast in there to basically, don't want to say inhibit, but basically allow it not to be able to combust in there anymore. So take anhydrous ammonia with us. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny, like as they were talking about this, I'm going to have you start heating this up here, Tyler. Okay. And what I want you to do is just uh, don't put it too close to it, but just kind of like this and just kind of move it around kind of help warm up that glass a little bit. Okay. And then when I tell you to, then just kind of hold it about right here to blow that water. Okay. Well, I talk. And so now we're gonna talk about gas contraction, okay? So all we have over here is just a little bit of water in there, we've got kind of a restricted opening. And we're just gonna kind of heat this up until it become, uh, gets to a boil. And then when it gets to a boil, I'm gonna pull it out. I'm gonna tip it upside down, just put the tip of this in there, and we're gonna see what happens, okay? So now you can just heat up the bottom, buddy. So can we see steam? Uh, is yep. steam visible? Yeah. yeah. So it's that's the that. water vapor. Yeah. There you go. So we can see water vapor, but we can't see steam. Steam. Okay. Just like this nitrogen, we can't see it. We can't see gas. Right. So we see water vapor. And so, like when we boil something, back that flame off just a little bit. So. We see water vapor, so like when you're boiling a pot of water on the stove and you can see the water vapor coming out, that's just what it is. And why is that? It was steam. Steam is cooling. Exactly. So it was once steam, right? Cold forms water as we heat it up, it expands out, it's separated, right? But then as it, once it turns into steam and it comes back into a cooler environment, a couple of those molecules are like, hey buddy, let's come back together. And they come back together just enough so that you can see them, but they can still float in the air. Wow. So like when you see mist in the morning and stuff, that's just water vapor, just not heavy enough to fall back to the ground. Yeah. Right? Okay. So we'll let that get going a little bit. And then we'll see some water vapor coming out of here. Same thing, it's steam in here, but then once it reaches a cool environment, it starts to condense and create um, the water vapor. When our mass, even like, you know, everybody's like so afraid of steam, but steam is a good thing for us. Water will only reach 212, 
And it's a fun experiment I did with my son. You can keep a thermometer in a boiling pot, it'll race up to 212. And if you keep it in there, it'll just stay at 212. Really? Water will never get above 212. Okay. Now once it converts to steam, there's a concept called superheated steam. And if, uh, if that stays in the, like if the fire's still going, it'll heat up that steam and it can become super hot. So as we gas cool, it's very important that we get to the seat of the fire at some point. There we see. Let's watch this in action. Everybody okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Jesus. I cooled down too quick. <laughs> no luck with that one. I'll, I'll play a video for you <laughs> so we can see it, but you can see what started to happen, right? Did everybody see that? Yeah. It scared me. It scared me too. <laughs> so here's a video I took of it in Sweden. So why is all the water rushing back in there? Temperatures. Um, That's all the the heat and the cool, they, they mix and it's got to that point that it would rise. How? It's set, uh, it has to do with the temperature differential. Yeah, the molecules are expanded and now they're cooling down, they contract, yeah, and, they and it creates negative pressure in there and it sucks all the water back in. Right. So what we're going to see when we go out to the drill gun is like when we apply the water, you're going to actually see a lifting of the environment. Okay, due to the uh, due to that contraction based off the cooling that we're providing, mm -hmm. and we're going to show how you can monitor that with your with your tick to see the effectiveness. Okay, okay. so when we're gas cooling, like they're experts at it out there, like they know just how much water to apply to make it effective without overdoing it. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's where I think we've gotten that in the American fire service, because we flow so much water, it's very easy to overdo it. Then you get that sauna effect, okay? And the sauna effect is just that. It feels like you're sitting in a sauna. It's a moist heat, okay? Mm -hmm. um, it can only burn you if you have something exposed, okay? It's not gonna burn us um, with, with our protective gear on. And the way they look at it in Sweden, it's like, even if there's a victim in there, they'd rather have a steam burn versus a <clears throat> severe thermal burn. Mm -hmm. okay? And that's just, a, that's just a philosophy, right or wrong. But what we're going to do is we're going to see the effects. You're going to probably see some times where we do it just right, and you're not going to feel it too much, and then there's going to be times when we do overdo it, and you're going to feel it a little bit, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you're not sure, if you feel the sauna effect, you've done enough. You've done enough. There's plenty of moisture in there to uh, inert that gas, so at least we know the smoke's not going to ignite on us, okay? Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to show you a video from Loveland. Uh, Loveland is, like I said, just a little bit ahead of us. Um, and like I said, we've been working with them really closely. They have a stick built burn house, um, single story with drywall and they burn real furnishings in there and they do a lot of study burns on them. And what I want everybody to focus on is this tick image up here, okay? Everything else doesn't really apply to what we're looking at today. And so you can see that they have 230. So the firefighters are gonna come in here and they're gonna push back away from us towards the fire room, which is right here. The door to the fire room is open. And it's really not even all that hot. It's about 2.30, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is the one thing that's important to understand as officers, when you're instructing gas cooling, you need to tell them how long to flow, okay? And so a lot of times, like in the States, we'll see people trying to do gas cooling and you'll see the pulsing, you know, that type of motion with the nozzle. I asked Mats Ronders, who was out in Sweden, uh, like I said, really cool because he hasn't taught in 20 years. Um, and there's a whole story behind that, but this is the first time he's taught in 20 years and he came back out for this class. And I asked him about it and he said, absolutely not. It's like, you don't want to pulse the smoke. It's like you flow enough water to get the desired result that you need. So like at low temperatures like this, right? This is just above boiling temperatures for water. You're going to see them. They're just going to do like a real short blast. They'll push in a little bit, real short blast, push in a little bit. So we've got that clamp slide technique right with nozzle forward all right where you're pushing the hose in like this what an ideal position to just have that nozzle there where you can gas cool as you go okay and that's only going to be based off of the officer's direction so if we gas cool at the door then we probably need to gas cool as we go okay if we gas cool what's an absolute that we need to have behind us if we're trying to change the environment air take control of it smoke curtain or something yeah, yeah door, door control, control. 
because if we're changing it and we're making it better, we leave the door open, then what we just improved upon is going right out. So we need to keep that in there, right? Until it's time to ventilate. And like in Sweden, they're like, our biggest benchmark is to get to the point where we can ventilate as much as we want to. And that's us getting water on fire, right? And then they're very aggressive with ventilation at that point. So like I said, look at this picture. We got fairly low temps, but look at the clarity. Can't really pick out too much definition in that room, right? So I want you to watch them go in and gas I want you to see how this is gonna change. Cause this is, for officers, this is how you're gonna gauge the effectiveness of it. Like, are we winning or not, okay? So not only are we gonna be looking at temperatures, but we're also gonna be looking at the lifting effect that we're getting through the tick, okay? Cause it might be dark, we may not be able to see with our own eyes. So they're coming in, we're gonna see them do a gas cool here, short blast. And just even watch after that first blast, you're gonna get a disturbance and then you're seeing a lift. See that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. Okay. Another gas cool, pushing in through the hallway. Another gas cool. Wow. Now look at the difference here. We can see some things, right? We can see the open door now, mm -hmm. right? We can see a little bit more. I could probably play it, it's gonna clear up a little bit more here. We can see more definite lines in the ceiling. Okay, and then the next slide here. These are just still shots that we took from before they made entry, 2.30, very little definition. And then by the time they made the fire room down to 199, more definition from what we can see in the tick, right? So with lower temperatures, we're not gonna get big dramatic temperature drops, okay? And we've had it like out in our burn house where it's like 600 degrees, you can easily bring it back down to roughly 200. So big drop there, okay? If you try it and you don't get much of an effect, try flowing a little bit more water and see if you can get that effect. And so all we're doing is like, we got a pretty hairy situation. We're like, man, you know, you know, 500 degrees or greater, we're like, Oosh, this is dangerous. We, we're, what we're gonna do is teach you that door procedure out there where you can flow some water in there, take a tick reading, get a benchmark, and then flow some water in there, shut the door for a little bit, let that steam work for you just for about two seconds, open it up, take a tick reading at the same spot, and that's real important, and see if we, if we got a drop. If we did, then now you got better information, like, okay, we're making a difference here. Not only am I dropping the temperature, you know you're inerting the gas. The gas will not light off on you, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that out there. So now we can, now you probably give the command, like especially if we're going at what you think is a good distance to the seat of the fire, hey, I need you to gas cool as we go. Get in there, have some door control, make that push gas cool, you can monitor, and then get to the seat of the fire, switch it back over to a straight stream, surface cool, hmm. ventilate, right? right? Any questions on that? This is so cool. Sorry, I blew up the flask. <laughs> 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 <So, laughs> yeah, That's why we have a backup video. Yeah. Because <laughs> Jason blew it up the first day, we're like, God, <laughs> but, uh, but we're, we're trying to heat it up more, more slowly, so. Sorry. But uh, if you guys want, let's go out and get on full uh, structure bunkers, SCBA, bring your ticks with you as well, and we'll meet out the burn house and do some hands-on work with us. All right. All right. Good. <laughs> okay. Okay.